We started the Learning Sciences Exchange in 2018 um, with our partners, Kathy Hirsch-Pasek and Roberta Golenkoff, and with the incredible support of the Jacobs Foundation. You'll hear from our partners in just a few minutes. This is um, a, a project that focuses on the first years of life. Um, the first two years we had our fellows focusing on ages um, from infancy to age five, and then our next cohort, which you'll also hear about, is going up through age eight. Um, so please use the LSX Summit hashtag um, if you want to follow us um, on social media and follow the conversation today. And I'm now going to turn this over to Anne Marie Slaughter, our CEO at New America, um, an incredible fervent supporter of all this work. Um, and we're so glad you can be with us as well today, Anne Marie. So take it away. So welcome everyone. I'm, I'm honored and so pleased to be able to be part of this summit uh, and to welcome you and say a few words just at the outset. In my academic life, I'm a network theorist and as CEO of New America, I'm a passionate advocate of creative ideas and big thinking. And the LSX exchange is all of those things. Uh, what what networks require, what creativity requires, what sweeping change requires is connection, uh, but not just any connection, active connection across difference. And that is exactly what this exchange is about, breaking down silos, bringing together people from many different worlds, from, from Hollywood to the academy, uh, to deep experts uh, in learning. So. Uh, in, in the, what we're going to see today really is the kind of creativity and big thinking that comes out of those kinds of connections. And I want to say just a quick word on the subject itself. Uh, when I came to New America in 2013, I was passionate about women uh, and equity and many other things, but New America and Lisa and her team taught me uh, to understand that early education is a national security issue. And beyond that, over the last seven years, I've come to think we should be spending as much on education, starting with early education, as we spend on national defense. And right now, I would say that how much we invest in our children is a measure of our future national security, our prosperity, and our morality, because nothing is more important for equity going forward than giving all of our children an equal shot. Last, I just want to say that New America understands that our greatest impact will be achieved not through growing New America itself into an enormous uh, uh, organization. We're 150 people now and it's a great size, but really through collaboration. And so the collaboration with the Jakob Jacobs Foundation and with the Congress of Infant Studies, which uh, both of which are our partners uh, in this work, is extremely important. And that means I'm particularly pleased to be able to turn over uh, the microphone or the Zoom box, I guess, <laughs> to Dr. Urs Arnold, who is the COO of the Jacobs Foundation. Uh, Dr. Arnold, over to you. Thanks very much. So also a very warm welcome uh, on behalf of the Jacobs Foundation to today's LSX Summit. Learning is at the very center of what we at the Jacobs Foundation are doing. Therefore, when we a couple of years ago had the opportunity to bring together the brightest minds in science, journalism, uh, policy and entertainment, it was just too good an opportunity not, not to engage. And, and meanwhile, we can say after these two years, it really turned into one of our flagship programs at the foundation. Why is that? It really is, and I mean, it also refers to what Anne-Marie said before, it very much allows its fellows to leave their, their sectoral and disciplinary silos and effectively collaborate with each other. And such cooperation is key for us as the foundation in all the work we're doing in all the projects and programs. With a strong focus on fellowships like this one, like the LSX one, also in our new strategy starting next year, we really hope to become one of the learning organizations by the year 2030. By 
supporting learning systems in low, medium and high resource contexts. And so in, in that context, even more, I'm looking so much forward and I was waiting for such a long time and we had so many meetings and preparing for all that. And now, now is the moment. So we're so happy and I'm looking so much forward to today's discussion and, and presentations. And, and because I'm sure it really helps, helps us and, and all people interested in this topic to, 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 to move forward and to, 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 to do a better job than before. Um, before I hand over to, uh, hand back to, to, to Lisa, I just want to say a few words of, of thanks and, and appreciation. One is that goes to, to, to Kathy and Roberta for their outstanding thought leadership in the program over the last two years. I mean, I learned so much from you and I'm so grateful for that. But an equal uh, thank you goes to Lisa and her team at, at New America. You did such an amazing job in managing the program. Without you, it would not have been possible. So thank you very much for, for all of that. And, and last but not least, also, I would like to thank Catherine in, in my team at the Jacobs Foundation. She has been working so hard over the last two years, and she was very much the, the voice and the face of the Jacobs Foundation in the program. So without her, it would not have been possible. Now, thank you again for joining us today. It's an amazing moment. Let's get going. I'm so much excited and looking forward to this, today's event. Uh, and with that, I'm handing back to you, Lisa. Thank you so much, Oris. Um, it's been really a pleasure to be working with the Agros Foundation and with Catherine um, in, in so many ways on this project. So now we are gonna move into our, the next phase, which is a, a panel discussion to just really help us lift up these issues and, and bring out the, the urgency behind communication of science, early learning, what the media can bring. So to, to join me in this, we have an amazing moderator with us today, Anya Kamenetz, who, hey, hey there, Anya, it's so good to see you. Anya is an education correspondent for National Public Radio. Many of you have probably heard her on the radio, um, doing some incredible pieces over the past several months and years. She also is the author of The Art of Screen Time, which is quite a pertinent book right now. And she is a, a friend and also an advisor to us on the Learning Sciences Exchange. So Anya, I'm going to pass it over to you to introduce our panelists. Sure. Um, sorry, and I, um, I just received a, a reminder. I'm so sorry, everybody, that right before Anya goes, we are going to run a video and bring on Kathy and Roberta. So my apologies. Um, let's run the video so you can all get a sense of what this Learning Sciences Exchange is all about. Over the past several decades, scientists in child development have discovered remarkable insights about how children learn. Research has uncovered just how important the early years of life are, how much they set the stage for humans to reach their full potential and learn how to learn. Yet that research is often hidden or cloaked in mysterious scientific language, inaccessible to the people who could use it most. The Learning Sciences Exchange was designed to address this problem. Over the past two decades, with support from and in partnership with the Jacobs Foundation, Lisa Guernsey of New America and Kathy Hirsch-Pasek and Roberta Golenkoff of the International Congress of Infant Studies devised a plan to elevate the science of early learning to be understandable and meaningful to far more members of society. The LSX Fellows Program brought together mid-career professionals from four different sectors, science, policy, journalism, and entertainment. The first cohort of LSX fellows comes from all over North America and Europe, from Southern California, Oregon, Florida, Washington, DC, Massachusetts, Vermont, Scotland, Great Britain, Germany, and France. The LS6 program allows the sector to leave their disciplinary and sectoral silos and effectively collaborate. The fellows met several times over the course of two years. They attended large international conferences and they had moments to play and learn together 
brainstorming new ways of communicating and applying the latest science. We found a way to communicate so using digital technology, um, meeting in person, and also realizing that even though we come from very different fields, that we share same, uh, same, the same values and um, also the same big goal of communicating the learning sciences. And so that helps to overcome all these other barriers. I'm hoping to help build up my beat um, in the social sciences around some child development related issues, such as writing about mental health issues that show up in early years or socioeconomic achievement gaps um, and how those carry through later life. My goal as a researcher is to try and impact the lives of developing children. <laughs> and that's really hard to do when you are um, trained as a researcher and not necessarily to communicate that information. The 12 fellows were divided into three groups and each group had a budget. Their task was to develop a service, prototype, or product that could make research about young children more accessible. New friendships and new professional relationships and hopefully just the ability to scale and impact a huge initiative. So figuring out how to how to move not only the public but also my boss and policymakers in general uh, toward the policies that we need to make for young kids and families. It's more of an, an understanding of early childhood, uh, what's current in research, how it evolves. Research is always changing and that's what's so exciting and, and so is storytelling. Today, the outcomes of these collaborations are available for all to see. These fellows have designed innovative ways of using video and storytelling, animations and music, board books and illustrations to bring the science of learning to life. And now LSX has expanded, bringing on 15 new fellows and adding social impact entrepreneurs to the mix. In two years, we'll see the fruits of the collaboration of our new cohort of fellows. The ultimate goal of LSX is to lift up the critical importance of early learning, setting up the next generation to flourish. It is my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Kathy hirsch Pasick, who is in the Department of Psychology at Temple University and a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. And it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Roberta Gollenkoff, who is a professor of education, psychology, linguistics, and cognitive science at the University of Delaware. You know, fake news really exists in every profession, but it's not always because somebody wants to woefully misinform the public. Many times it's because they really don't understand how to take the latest evidence and the latest research and translate it in a way that the lay public can understand. The Learning Sciences Exchange is meeting this challenge. It's for this purpose, to help all children and families thrive. We welcome you all today to the launch of our second cohort. And now back to Lisa Guernsey. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kathy and Berta. It's such a, a thrill to be on this with you. And thank you for um, helping us to hold this all together in so many ways. Um, and now I'm going to bring Anya back in and um, we'll, we'll get to the, the panel discussion. We're hoping that, that that video gave you all a little bit more of an understanding of how LSX works. And Anya is now going to, to bring us um, the panelists that will help us kind of understand how this fits into the broader scheme of everything. So thank you so much, Anya, for being with us. Sure. Hi, everybody. I wish I could lead you in a round of applause for Kathy and Roberta for all of their contributions and their thought leadership in this space. I've learned so much from them. Um, I've learned so much from you as well, Lisa. And, you know, we're really engaged in something so special here. Uh, 
the complexities and the knowledge base that it takes to create the best future for our kids um, really, you know, it, it necessitates this kind of innovative collaboration. And this is a very rare space where this can happen. So I'm just, you know, I'm so proud to be able to uh, play this somewhat advisory role. So I'm here to introduce a panel, um, an interdisciplinary panel. Um, everyone here is, is engaged with uh, learning and young people and and, and uh, to some extent media innovation um, and we're here to really I was asked to kind of give just a big picture overview as far as um, why do we need these kinds of collaborations what's missing um, in the way that research gets translated to parents and to the public um, in terms of the kinds of tools and media and books and videos and apps that parents actually have in their hands and the kinds of messages that they get that they're able to act on, how, what, what are the disconnects between the research and practice? Um, so uh, I'm going to introduce our panelists and then I'm gonna um, start with some questions. So we have with us um, Madeline DeNono, who is the CEO of the Gina Davis Institute on Gender and Media, which is the leading research-based nonprofit working to influence entertainment and media in a positive direction, namely to achieve gender equity in the types of images that um, our children get. And so, um, you know, just an incredibly important mission. Um, previously, Donono has served in executive leadership positions for NBC Universal, Hallmark Channel, Anchor Bay Entertainment, and Stars Media. Um, so a very um, a big mover and shaker in terms of making the media. Uh, Joan Lombardi, Dr. Joan Lombardi, currently directs Early Opportunities LLC, which is a philanthropic advisement service focused on the development of young children, families, and the communities that support them. Um, so she's an innovative leader and policy advisor in the areas of child and family policy. Um, she advises groups that make grants like the Buffett Early Childhood Fund, the Pritzker Children's Initiative, and the Bain and Family Foundation. She's also a senior scholar and adjunct professor at the Center for Child and Human Development at Georgetown University and a veteran of um, public service as well. Ralph Smith um, is currently the managing director of the Campaign for Grade Level Reading, a national network of communities focused on promoting early learning, grade level reading, and early school success never more important than right now, this mission. Um, he served on many corporate boards, nonprofit boards, and recently retired as Senior Vice President of the Annie E. Casey Foundation, and hopefully everyone here knows about their important work. Um, so my first question is going to go to Ralph. In your experience and in your belief, why is there a gap between the latest scientific research on child development and the decisions that parents and caregivers are making every day as they raise children in real life? Oh, you've got to unmute, sorry. There, and there as go. I began to speak, there really was a prompt right in the middle of my screen saying ah. un unmute, and of course I ignored the prompt and started. Uh, <laughs> so why don't people respond to messages that are right in front of them? <laughs> that's, that's exactly, that's exactly the point. Um, you know, with the campaign for grade level reading, uh, we have a number of audiences. And so there are different ways to respond to that question. But let me choose the audience that is least powerful, least influential, but perhaps most important. And that's the audience of the parents and caregivers and neighbors and communities uh, surrounding the children who are most at risk. Uh, these are the folks who we hope to nudge uh, toward what they need to know and need to be able to do to improve the lived experience and futures for their children. And in many respects, uh, research is numb uh, to this particular audience. Um, research and researchers uh, do not acknowledge that this is an audience that has uh, good reason to be skeptical 
of research and expertise because this is an audience about who research has been done. In fact, research has been done to them and very rarely from their perspective for them. Uh, data has been, data have been used as a weapon against them and that often as a tool for them. Uh, experts and expertise ha um, have been seen as a privilege uh, and a privilege which uh, dismisses the knowledge that comes from intuition, from lived, and, and lived experience, and the knowledge that springs from culture. And so for all those reasons, there's a, a skeptical audience uh, at the core of this work and until we acknowledge that that skepticism is real, it is well-founded with good reason, we're not gonna be able to communicate as effectively as we can. And when we get into the conversation, I'll share a bit about how the Campaign for Grade Level Reading responds to that. Now I did it too. Uh, thank <laughs> you so much. Um, it, it, these are really deep critiques that you're raising. And I think there was an assumption embedded in my first question, which was that the assumption is that research, scientific research should be informing our parents as they go about their daily, li our daily lives of decision-making. Um, and I think you're, you're very right to point out that not every community feels equally that that's the case uh, or that there is enough. And oftentimes because there's not enough relevant research, pertaining to that community or um, with the issues that are most on their minds. So this is a, a, a deep problem. Um, it, so Dr. Lombardi, I wonder if when you think about the policy facing arm of kind of the research apparatus, um, how do these disconnects affect early childhood policy? Why do we never seem to have enough public attention on the issues of early childhood um, or of course enough cash? Sure. Well, uh, thanks, An Anya. You know, I want to first build on what Ralph said about parents, because I think they're related to policymakers, um, or they should be. Uh, their conditions, you know, I think parents trust, <clears throat> they listen to trusted messages in their lives. They don't always listen to the media. Uh, they also have to be active participants in the information, and it can't just be one time. So, uh, you know, both of those factors are important when trying to communicate with parents. On top of that, we expect people to receive information and then act on it, and it's not that simple. Our lives are complicated, the lives of parents are complicated, <clears throat> they've got a lot of pressures, so they're not going to always act on what we're, we're saying. Uh, turning to policymakers, you know, I think uh, in my long history in the field, we've made some progress in communicating messages because we've simplified them from research and we've gotten a lot of help from commu communication people like Frameworks Institute and other people. Um, but what's been missing is trying to use those messages to increase resources and investments in early childhood <clears throat> and to help people understand what we want, not just why it's important, but what we want. And so we've got to go an extra mile in communicating those two messages because it's hard to get them through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Madeline Denona, you work in the realm of trying to get better messages in media, um, media for kids, um, I presume also media for parents. What are your thoughts about this challenge and how media can actually help? Well, for us, you know, what we have found is that what, what happens in the fictional world can play out in the real world. And if you look at the pandemic that we're all in the midst of, I mean, just streaming has gone up 85%. And if you look at some of the data from our friends at Common Sense Media, you know, media consumption by, you know, young children is seven to 10 hours um, engaging with some type of media device consuming media. So, you know, when you look at the pie of what's influencing a child, 
uh, media is taking up a big piece of that pie, and particularly with the pandemic, um, and parents being absolutely, you know, exhausted and complicated, as you know, Joan and Ralph alluded to, parents who would never hand their two-year-old the device are just handing that kid the device um, just because they can't do the normal activities that they would do. And what we have found, you know, from our research, particularly, you know, when we look at, you know, what influences girls to go into STEM, and we know that girls fall out of STEM in, in, in middle school, you know, media has a lot um, of influence in that. You know, we actually conducted a study where um, girls actually cited Doc McStuffins as a reason why they decided to, you know, pursue STEM. And even the Scully effect, which was on, you know, in the 90s, 63% of the women working in STEM now grew up watching Gillian Anderson um, in the Scully, you know, character. So we believe media can have a positive, positive effect and we've used the data as our advocacy. And we've been very su successful because we've really been striving for cultural equity and inclusion. And we have been able to achieve that in children's television and family film. Um, but when you look at other dimensions like race, LGBTQ plus disabilities, and we actually look at age and, and body type, we're really you know, fall, falling short behind. Um, but that's kind of our, our methodology is um, being able to use media as a glimpse into um, aspiration, whether it's uh, careers or other types of activities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think what, what you're saying really uh, gets right to the heart of the complexity of what we're talking about, because on the one hand, you're talking about positive messages within media and the idea that we can make better content decisions for our children and also the way that media has really become an, uh, a partner in raising our children, um, you know, almost more than ever before uh, during the pandemic. So it's really pretty important that it be high quality. On the other hand, when you talk to se about seven to 10 hours a day, the media really is the message. It doesn't matter how high quality the content is. We have concerns about exposure. Um, and it crowding out other uh, experiences, other other behaviors, um, and and indeed, you know, parenting itself. So, uh, you know, how do we communicate then to parents uh, about an issue just as complex as this media exposure, knowing that it's only one of the many areas in which we would like early childhood science to be um, felt in 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 family life. You know, I think one of, <clears throat> one of the things that would help is that we, the messages are common. Right now, especially during the pandemic, parents are just being bombarded with messages. And I think it's really hard for them to sort out. It's hard for them to make decisions. Do I send my child to school? Who's telling, who's telling me the truth about what's going on? Um, and I think there's a lot of fear and anxiety. So the simpler we can make our messages, I think the better. Yeah. You know, what I would add to, the, to that uh, is a real plug for popular media. And I think uh, the work of uh, Too Small to Fail uh, is the most recent example. Uh, we saw two decades ago the term deadbeat dad virtually disappear. Mm from popular parlance because the media was used specifically to humanize fathers who did not live with their children and for five years uh, in prime time. We saw wonderful role models of fathers who cared very much about their kids even though they weren't living with them. And literally, University of Maryland uh, tracked this that term dead be dead in five and a half years literally disappeared. And if we all think about it, when's the last time we heard it? And that was very much a driver of uh, social policy. So we, we so I want to really endorse uh, Madeline and Madeline's and Joan's point about the potential of popular media. And I want to come back and say that, you know, we there's something we call 
com common sense science. And what common sense science really requires is the active and intentional translation of the research to see whether to, to align with common sense. And for a whole lot of researchers who have gotten accustomed to winning the argument simply by the evidence incantation, especially if you say evidence-based, um, the notion that we've got to interrogate the research and find ways to close the gap between the research and common sense, and instead, in fact, restate the research in ways that allow it to come closer to according to common sense. It seems somehow abhorrent and even offensive to some uh, re researchers. But we believe that you've got to find the gap between research and common sense, mind the gap, and close the gap between research and common sense. And the extra effort to do that is well worth it because we need uh, those parents and neighbors and caregivers and communities actually to understand and have sufficient confidence in the research that they're willing to make different decisions, change behaviors, uh, and move together toward better futures for kids. So mm -hmm. this notion of common sense science, uh, trust me, they're not gonna be widely embraced by real scientists, but mm -hmm. it's a practice that really should be embraced by people who wanna uh, change the response to research that's truly important. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with Ralph. I, I, I remember being a young early childhood teacher uh, many, many years ago, and a big national study came out about the importance of group size, smaller groups, and training. And I was sitting there in my classroom thinking, well, why didn't they just ask us? You know, we could have told them that. So there really is something to, to tying this to common sense, to tying this to neighborhood wisdom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I guess I, I feel like I have to respond as someone who sits on the media side of the, the table ar around, you know, wh why does this disconnect continue to take place? And, you know, the media is under its own pressures to uh, drive traffic, uh, even at an outfit, a nonprofit out like, like NPR, we, we still respond to things that get a lot of traffic. And people re read out of anxiety, they read out of fear and things that respond to their fear and anxiety get amplified. And we in the media have to be very, very aware of that. And I think, um, you know, I'm very grateful for opportunities like LSX that allow the members of the media journalists to talk and form those relationships with researchers. I found for myself as someone who covers science and covers research, relationships are just so important because there's that trust, that implicit level um, that you can have with someone where you're not just, you know, looking for a clickbait headline, but you're looking at the overall sweep of, of the research um, and being able to pick things apart. I think also on the side of the media, you know, recently um, we're, we're all engaged in trying to interpret very quickly emerging science right now on coronavirus and coronavirus in children. And uh, we in the media have to be very responsible for that. And what we've discovered, for example, um, at NPR, is that we need to collaborate. We need to collaborate between our science desk, our health desk, our education desk, because they know doctors and we know kids. And we actually did a piece where we talked about safe schools reopening and we interviewed several epidemiologists looking at school reopening plans, but we also interviewed the head of the teacher union and the head of the school nurse association because they know a whole lot more about what is actually realistic and how a recommendation might play out when it comes to a six-year-old who wants to take their mask off because they're having an asthma attack. Um, so, you know, it, it's really incumbent on all of us to build those relationships, I think. Um, you know, it, it's not something that can be done through press releases. We have to keep talking to each other um, to get better stories out there. Well, let, me, let me just quickly say that uh, the drive traffic imperative could be part of the problem. Of course. Because, because drive traffic, uh, when I hear it, I don't hear low-income parents 
and communities as within the definition of the, tra of the desired traffic. And unless and until traffic includes those hardest to reach communities, uh, we're gonna continue to have that gap between what the resource says, what the resource says and what uh, folks do. I think that's a really, really well taken point. I know that in NPR we're engaged in a huge push toward diversity, equity, and inclusion because we know that diversifying our audience um, is not just important for accuracy in our reporting, but also it's the future of who's going to be listening to us. Um, so, but that's that's a really well taken point. Um, Madeline, I want you to, to bring you in here to talk a little bit about what does the relationship building look like on your end? How do you convince um, people who make media to embed a stronger uh, social mission in what they do? So, you know, the um, we work in a number of different verticals, um, advertising, film, streaming, TV, and we're actually um, launching our foray into uh, video gaming. Uh, next year, we're really excited about that. And what we have found is because we've always had a focus on what our youngest children see in family entertainment, the creators of this entertainment want to do good by our, our children. You know, they are parents, they are, you know, caretakers um, themselves. And it's just, they weren't aware of the unconscious bias that was embedded in the on-screen media. And, and, and you have to, just to make the point, we focus in what's happening in the content. Um, versus what's happening behind the camera, because when it comes to hiring and pay equity, that's conscious bias. And there's a lot of, you know, there's guilds, there's a lot of great organizations focusing on that. But we believe that um, it's, an, it's an easy opportunity to use cultural equity inclusion, you know, in content, particularly content, you know, for kids, because you're talking about, you know, character. Um, and so w there's always been a receptivity. And because we do use data, we use machine learning and human expert coding to essentially assess you know, the content. We organize it based on an intersectional lens. So we look at six dimensions, gender, race, LGBTQ, LGBTQ plus disabilities, age, body type. Um, and then we kind of put forth um, you know, those, those recommendations. We don't shame and blame. And we do a, a lot of you know, consulting and it has to do with the way the message is served up. You know, as you know, Ralph was saying, you know, uh, uh, parents can be very skeptical you know, of data, but our, the way that we present our data, we're not attacking the creators, we're not telling them what to do, we're not telling them how to be storytellers. We're just saying, look, if diversity and inclusion is important to you because you'll, you'll perform better in your ads, You'll sell more stuff. You'll make more money at the box office. If, you're, if, you're, if your content is diverse, you will have diverse you know, audiences. Um, so there's a business imperative that also goes with the social imperative, which has been you know, proven out. And we have found people to be you know, very receptive, but it is changing a way of thinking. And it's really that they just didn't realize how they were describing their character or that all the characters were white and male and it's only been just pointing it out over and over and over again like Ralph was talking about the um the deadbeat dad you know trope um it's just that repetition of, of presenting it has really been very successful you know for us in getting the needle to move yeah I think the repetition is key Madeline and I'm so glad you brought that up because you know you don't learn something when you hear it once and the integration of that with entertainment and the whole way this fellowship is, is being put together is really going to, I think, help advance uh, our cause when it comes to policy and trying to move policy, which is maybe the hardest. There may be a lag behind what parents want. There is a lag. Um, I think we have to be aware of how policymakers think. They think. Uh, it, uh, about what is in front of them right now. So those repeated messages have to be timely to the decisions they're making. For example, right now, we need many more messages 
that are showing how hard uh, the impact has been on so many families and the need to support them with the benefits that can help them pay for basic needs. You know, Susan Fitzgerald uh, has put a, a really important question in the chat box and one which I think um, uh, deserves uh, an, an answer. And, and her question was, how do we account for those occasions, and there are many, when the combination of culture, intuition, and uh, lived experience just plain wrong, and in fact, even even harmful. And I think that's a that's a really important question that we not assume that the combination of intuition and lived experience always lead to virtuous results. We have powerful evidence to the contrary. And my mine is uh, my partial response and inadequate response, Susan, is that. It requires a level of intentionality about building the relationships, uh, building the trust relationships that would allow the, bridge, the, the, the bridges between researchers and communities and having and treating even the wrong headed uh, but well intended <laughs> common sense results as. As, with respect, and then taking the time to work with communities. And, and I think Joan's point is bring them into the research in partnership so, so that there's a shared uh, evolution of knowledge and not something that's imposed that we're right and you're wrong. But I think it's a really important uh, challenge to which we have to respond and which I hope is within the reach of what I'm hoping is going to be common sense science. We have a lot more great questions that uh, I understand that we'll have time to get to later on. Um, I wonder if uh, anyone else wants to offer thoughts that could be helpful for the new class of fellows as they think about how to form these relationships and how to um, you know, combine research with practice and creativity with science. You know, Anya, I would just say to the new class of fellows, any fellows that I would be talking to, <clears throat> just believe you can make a difference because because they will, and uh, and be persistent about what you're trying to get across. Wonderful, Madeline. Any final thoughts? Well, you know. We're, I mean, we're more of a B2B than a B2C, although all of our research is made available on our website. We have translated our research because one of the things that um, Anya, you were talking about and Joan and Ralph was that research can be wonky, right? So how do you make it accessible and digestible? So we've converted our research into toolkits, tips for parents. We have educational curriculum. We have, you know, videos to just make it more um, um, dig digestible. Um, and that's been very helpful for us. And also we're dealing with real, you know, very, very busy executives who have very short attention spans. So uh, visualization, data visualization has been the key. When they see a box with check marks, it's an immediate, yes, this, we've done well from an intersectional lens. No, we have not. Thumbs up, thumbs down, you know, so we've really, really simplified it um, so that people can immediately look at it and get it. And, you know, unfortunately, some of the best research in the world is just sitting in some Word document um, that no one will ever read. So it's been really important for us to make sure that we can take our research to the ground, so to speak, and make it easy for anybody um, to to use and that's been uh, that's been helpful and it, and I think it's also been uh, been a way we've been successful also because you have to be able to speak to your audiences which is something that Joan and Ralph and even you said early on um, when people can become skeptical you know of data. Um. 
Okay, thank you very much. I'm gonna hand this over to, um, uh, to Lisa, who's gonna introduce the group projects in group Great. one. Yes, thank you so much, Anya. Um, already so many important thoughts coming out of that discussion, and I'm so grateful to all of you, Joan, Ralph, uh, Madeline, thanks so much for being with us to lift this up. The, what I was hearing through that, that I think we'll really see in the next section of this event um, was the relationship, relationship building piece and really listening across these different sectors and silos and then really listening to parents and those who are on the ground. So I think you're gonna hear a little bit more about that. What we're gonna do next um, is move to really the centerpiece of our, our summit, which is to really showcase the work of the 12 fellows who came together and starting in 2018. As you saw in the video, we, are, um, we were able to bring these folks together, help them get to know each other, but we also, um, assigned them to teams and they were given a budget and they were asked to create something, create something wholly new that could help to elevate the science of learning or communicate in new ways to, to families and parents, to policymakers. And so I think you're going to be really thrilled with the result of that. It's pretty exciting. So I'm going to, we're going to start now um, by bringing you the a story of the first group of fellows that we, we put together um, that includes, I'll, I'll just um, name them now and then you're going to see them on camera after you, you see their, their work and we'll have a moment for us all to ask them some questions and respond to them so you can put your questions uh, in that Q&A box and we'll be collecting those. What we're going to be doing next, um, we'll show the story of, like I said, the first group. This is Robert Carpenter of the University of California's uh, Media Institute for Social Change, Sujata Gupta, Gupta of Science News, Lisa Scott of the University of Florida, and Katie Whitehouse, formerly of the National League of Cities and now with the Council of DC. So um, they're just fantastic, amazing people, and I can't wait for you to see their story. So let's go ahead and run the video that tells their story. What drew me to LSX is the fact that it was the very first fellowship that combined research, public policy, along with filmmaking and journalism. And I thought, how interesting to be able to kind of cross-pollinate. When my son was a baby, we just thought we could read anything to him. And we're pretty educated, you know, like we, we thought that the message was just read to your kids. Like, anything is fine. And there, we have a picture of him like in his diaper and he's like a couple months old sitting on my husband's lap, like reading some enormous book. I don't even know what it is. I do think there's sort of a misperception that babies, when they can't talk, don't understand things. And I think that that's another important thing to make clear is that babies really do understand quite a bit far earlier than they can, you know, speak and communicate themselves. The message is essentially to, you know, read the right books at the right time. So when you're reading to infants when they're younger and you name characters in a book with a proper level name like Betty, um, they tend to pay more attention to those characters and they learn more about those characters. It seems that they're a little bit more engaged when the characters have names. I mean, I think that if we can increase parents' awareness that these early years are, are valuable and important and that reading to your child as an infant is an important uh, thing to do and to, an important way to spend your time as a caregiver, that would be, that would be the ideal outcome. We talked a lot about storytelling and how, how you tell a story and what, what story we were trying to tell. And so I think that that's kind of how we, we ultimately got down the pathway of a PSA. It was really a great opportunity to say, how can we communicate what we're trying to communicate, but do it in a really unique way, do it in a fun way, do it in a dynamic way, and do it in a funny way. One of the things about PSAs that we talked about while we were just making this decision to do this was so many PSAs that were around when we were kids are still stuck in our heads. Um, I mean, we, you can call to mind many of them. I haven't seen them in 20 years. I think the process of choosing the PSA was something that was organic. I mean, I had no idea 
what it would take to do a PSA when we initially were throwing that idea around. I was always sort of skeptical about pulling this off because it seemed like such a huge thing to do. Um, but, you know, I also thought, well, if we can do it, that's, that's amazing. Ultimately, I wrote the draft script and we had Katie and Sujata and actually the LSX committee as well as some advisors look over the script, make their creative contributions until we came to a polished script. I think for Rob, it was immediately clear that we needed to use humor because he was kind of like, people latch onto humor, they pay attention to humor. We wanted to take an approach that said we can make something that's important, also entertaining and fun and therefore accessible for the average family that's not necessarily going to look for serious minded and serious sounding PSAs. So we had scheduled the shoot and it was happening in um, Los Angeles. I have never been on the set of anything and so it was interesting to see that and also to see just the different aspects of, um, of what comes into play. Like the fact that there are people who rent out their houses for things like this. I mean, I just had no idea. And I think it's a lovely, it's, a, it's just a great product and it is funny, but also gets to the moral of our story. I think there's a lot of uh, research within the infant literature that's ready to be communicated to caregivers. Storytelling is a vehicle that allows people not only to express themselves, not only to be moved emotionally, but that allows people to create social change within themselves and within others. So I'm glad you all could see that. I really appreciate, um, just it's, it's really fun to see the, the work that's gone into this. And now you're gonna see the actual product, the actual PSA that this group has developed. We'll also be having, all of these are gonna be available on our websites. I know that for some of you, there may be a little bit of a lag in the audio depending on your internet, um, but you'll be able to see them that way too. So let's go ahead and we'll run the PSA that they created. <laughs> It's, a, it's Charles. Yeah, you know, I am so glad that we are co-babysitting our granddaughter, huh? Two grandpas, one baby. <laughs> We're living the dream, huh? Yeah, this, this is a dream. Oh, and I brought some books to read to little Josephina. You see the key to good baby book reading there, Chucky? It's Charles. It's not so much what you read, it's how you read it, right? You gotta entertain them. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's not true. No, 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 it's about the voices, right? It's like, okay, okay, so, <clears throat> okay. The itsy bitsy spider went up the water spout. But down came the rain and said, You shall not pass! Up came the sun, you know, with a cowbell, dried the rain. And then the itsy bitsy spider, well, he decided to do it again. You know, because what else am I gonna do? I'm a spider, I mean, I could go over. Okay, you know, you know what? Stop, stop, stop. What? In voices are scaring little Josephine. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Look. The key to reading to a baby is not to read it children's books. You gotta, gotta read it something that's gonna stir its, uh, its, its soul. It's passion. <laughs> Urban love story. Watch this. <clears throat> well, hello, Deshaun. Did you get my letters? Girl, I ain't got time for no reading. <gasps> but Deshaun. I love you. Baby, I love you too. But this whole reading love letters things, it's so, you know, completely romantic. Everything you ever dreamed of. Mm-mm. Your reason for living. Okay, okay, whoa, 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 okay, all right, look. I'm not gonna sit here and let you just read these trashy romance novels to our little Josephina, huh? Let's just do it my way, okay? No, no, let's I just do it my way. Here, let me give it my way. Is it the H.E.P.C. fighter? Deshaun, remember when we went on that trip? And watched Deshaun now. And I saw you in Bridget. You know what? Hold on, what's going on in here? Nothing. 
You are clearly having a baby book battle contest. What? <laughs> no. 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 <laughs> dad, I am so disappointed in you. Deshaun, really, Dad? Deshaun? If you would have just followed my instructions right here, then you would have seen the right way to read to little Josephina based on the latest cutting edge research. It's about reading the right kinds of books at the right time. And for babies, that means emphasizing character names, okay? Like in this book, if you come across a character that's an elephant, don't just call it an elephant. Give it a name, like Mr. Wigglesworth or Dante or Charisse. Or Grandpa Charlie, the, the cool one. When a baby under nine months actually hears a character's name in a book, they pay more attention, learn more, and their brains grow. It's just science. No, science. 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 One of our participants in the audience who has a, has a first question and response, and I want to bring her into the conversation for a moment with us to ask, ask the first question of these amazing fellows. So Jessica Sager, who's CEO of All Our Kin. Hello, Jessica. So nice to see you. And um, Jessica also just um, is now joined our advisory board. So she'll be advising us for the next cohort of fellows. Um, but Jessica has not had a chance to meet these fellows. And um, this may be the first time, I think, Jessica, that you've seen this work. So we'll, I'm, I'm going to be monitoring for other questions that are coming in. But why don't you go ahead, Jessica, and ask whatever you'd like to ask. Thank you so much. So first of all, I am so thrilled to be here. The panel with which we began was just phenomenal. And I'm so delighted to meet the current fellows and work with the new fellows. Um, I'm here with my colleague, Jana Wagner, and we're with All Our Kin, which is an organization that works with family child care educators. And that makes me especially excited about this PSA because family child care educators partner so deeply with parents and grandparents they are, in fact, those trusted messengers that Joan Lombardi spoke about, and they are always looking for new ways to bring the science of early care and education and the strategies and techniques that they use and share those with families. So I'm really excited about that. And that really, uh, I think, tees up my question, which is this. Um, how can you imagine this PSA being used? Can you imagine being something that early childhood educators can share? Are there ways that maybe you can imagine using the tools of social media to take pieces of this and disseminate it more widely? When you imagine ways to share this message, um, which is so full of joy and love and wonder and science, mm -hmm. um, how do you think about networks for doing that? Lisa, did you wanna answer that? Sure. I. I I can start and maybe Rob, you, you can finish. Um, you know, I, in, in my view, I, I'm just so excited that we're getting to um, be able to communicate science in such a fun uh, and exciting way that, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that we can spread this information, you know, uh, pretty, pretty widely. Uh, Rob and I have talked a little bit about a series of PSAs that might be related to um, early childhood development and, and kind of continue along the same theme. And uh, I guess, Rob, I'll let you talk a little bit more about what, what your interest <laughs> is also. I know we talked about some other options too. Sure, absolutely. And I think one option as well, in addition to a series of PSAs, is also potentially turning the two grandpas, one baby concept into the first science-based sitcom. So we're in discussions now 
with a number of potential funders and hopefully some networks pretty soon to see, can we take this great research, which was based on Lisa's wonderful research that she did, and can we, all, can, can we embed this research into a longer form kind of show? Can we also embed other researchers from the Jacobs Foundation New America, potentially even participants sort of in this event into some of these shows to really try to communicate this message through broadcast TV, through streaming, through YouTube, through any number of mechanisms, because we really wanted to showcase that parents have a yearning, a desire, especially millennial parents, to try to consume information. Millennials, more than any other group, it's shown, want to actually digest information and do parenting right. And so we think that it's a the great opportunity and a great time to showcase something like this. So hopefully all any and all sort of communication mechanisms will take into consideration and put out. That is great. Can I ask one really quick follow-up or maybe make a really quick follow-up plug? Um, you know, I feel like to, to some of the points that were made earlier about representation, caregivers, particularly home-based caregivers, whether they are family, friend, and neighbor caregivers or family child care educators, um, they're usually not represented on television at all. And when they show up, I have seen the ugliest kind of stereotypes around what they do and who they are. So can I encourage you to put some really wonderful caregivers in your show um, and really make their work visible? Um, and I'm, I'm thrilled about the sitcom idea. I completely love it. Thank you. Yeah, and it was really a concept of the whole group, even in this PSA, to make it multicultural, to make it multigenerational, and to really make the caregivers to be grandpas as opposed to women or other things. We wanted to flip the script, so to speak, to showcase that there are different types of caregivers than have been stereotyped in television for so long. So I definitely agree with that. I think our group probably would as well. Great. Thank you so much, Jessica, for, for joining us um, and getting kicking, kicking off the, the conversation with our fellows here. Another question that has come in um, from uh, Michael Levine, and we'll hear from him in a moment as well, is just about modeling the act of reading with children. And um, if you might be able to, any of you, um, talk a little bit more about whether that's something that can come, um, can come into play in additional productions of this or even shortening it in some ways um, that might model being with a child and using a children's book. Anyone want to take sure. that? Sure. I, I can uh, answer that. Sorry, I didn't see the question in, in, the, in the chat um, specifically, but, you know, I think that um, book reading you know, and I might be biased because I do study early book reading in the first year of life, but to me, it is one of the most important uh, developmental tasks and um, supports that parents can begin as early as birth and continue on. Uh, it provides time where babies and caregivers get to snuggle, they get to um, interact, they get face-to-face -face communication. A lot of times it's a little bit quieter, maybe sometimes at night or before bed. And so, um, and, and parents use a lot more words and a lot of vocabulary when they're reading books or when they're explaining things uh, to infants in, um, in the course of book reading. So uh, I, you know, I think that it's really an important, uh, um, I guess, activity for us to promote and to try and uh, better support in the first year of life and, uh, you know, and continually throughout childhood and just to make it a part of the routine. And so I think modeling this and also sharing this information about uh, certain kinds of books leading to more uh, um, attentive infants or naming characters leading to infants um, paying a little bit more attention and, uh, you know, being more engaged, I think that is um, uh, an important message that also supports the message of just reading in general. And, uh, well, if we have time for just maybe uh, one more one more question, uh, wondering, and, and Sujata and Katie, because I know that kind of writing and being succinct is very much um, in your line of work as well. 
how hard was it to distill? And um, what does it mean to really kind of shorten and simplify messages like this? Well, I think we were really lucky in that uh, Lisa's research was easily able to be distilled, um, read the right books at the right time. Um, I, I think that that it, we just got very lucky that 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 was, um, that was who was in our group and that is the research that she's been focusing on for so many years. Um, and I, this, the script really, I mean, Rob and Lisa just took so much of the, um, the first stab at that. I mean, Rob's experience in this space and um, as Sujata mentioned in the video, his uh, wanting to focus right in on uh, humor is really what drove what drove those messages. Um, I can remember in the first, the first while we were initially talking about what we were going to do, um, I think many of us wanted, the, the three of us, maybe wanted to be a little bit more poignant and, um, and, and show some, I don't know, the softer side of things. And, and Rob was just like, that kind of a budget was not going to work for us. And I think that humor is going to be really where we need to be heading. And, uh, and, it, and it turned out to be great. So I think we just, we got really lucky in our group of four. Any other quick comments? And we're gonna to move to group two. Um, okay. Well, there's plenty of opportunity to continue the conversation in the chat. There's some really good questions and um, ideas that are already coming in there. And just congratulations, you guys. It's, it's really exciting to see this, uh, this final product and to be seeing what can come of it in the future. Um, so for all of those who are watching this and wanna know more, all of this will, will be posted on, on the website. You'll be seeing lots more on social media about it as well. So thanks so much to all of you. And we will um, move you off camera now and we're gonna go to our second group of fellows. We're going to be um, bringing in and telling the story of Kat DeLang, of new scientist, Jana Panki, of what in English we would call the, in, the uh, Little Scientist House, which is a nonprofit based in Berlin that works on professional development for teachers of young children. Megan McClelland of Oregon State University and Jill Schinderman of Barclay Square Media. And you are about to hear kind of the story of how they got together and what they chose to create. So let's run Let's run the video of their story. Because children can't talk to us, they can't easily communicate with us, it's not very clear that they're literally taking in every single thing that they experience from the minute they're born. They do so much more learning than we're even aware of. This early phase with children can be a whirlwind for parents and they just don't have the time or they don't know how exactly can I create these interactions. Parents on the one hand feel like they would like more information about stuff that they should be doing and on the other hand they feel completely bombarded with too much information that they can't kind of sift through. We were thinking you know how can we create something that speaks to both of those things. The series itself is called Bunny to Bunny and book one in the series is called Sing Me Your Song. And it's really an opportunity for um, infant and caregiver to really kind of just take a breath and have that meaningful moment. I think a really important message for us in the book is one, to reassure parents that they're, they're doing the right thing and that they're, the, the engagement and the positive engagement and um, interactions they have with their baby are, are so important and maybe even more important than they realize. We know that healthy relationships and positive interactions um, are something that really help children grow. Jill really came in with the idea of doing a book and she has a lot of expertise there and I think it was something that we all felt really excited about because, you know, as a parent you read so much to kids and also that physical connection that you have with a book um, and what that brings to the relationship between an, an adult and a child I think is something that we already kind of were excited about. We all really love books and the research is, is there as to the value of, of books of course in healthy relationships for children and their caregivers. So as we were looking at different illustrations and different styles that we wanted to reflect, Kat had a wonderful best friend that she grown up with and she's this gifted illustrator who's just amazing. Emily drew this picture for me 
when my daughter was born. So she sent it and I had it like up on my mantelpiece and I just loved it and I was suddenly like, hang on a minute, I'm doing this book called Bunny to Bunny and like one of my best friends has randomly like drawn me this picture. We were like, oh my gosh, yes, this is exactly who we're looking for. And so Emily Snape is our fabulous illustrator and she was so wonderful to work with. And Emily and I worked closely every step of the way um, looking at just the types of illustrations that we wanted to have to reflect each rhyme and each poem, the elements in each real illustration as far as the positioning, everything remained in the natural animal world. So we tried to constantly check, are we making these illustrations as active and engaging as we can? So it's not something that someone just reads to a child. It would encourage the parent or the caregiver to then be really interacting in better, high, you know, high quality ways with that baby. I think one of the things that really drove us from the start is how do we create a book um, that would be really fun, engaging, and also somehow science-based. We decided at the end to have these little science tips or carrots that could really, after a parent or a caregiver read through the book, it was a great way in a very accessible way to see how the content of the books was really connected very clearly to current understandings of some of these things. And it was also um, fun and also a challenging process to write the science notes in a way that they are true to the science but still accessible. Megan and I were writing the first draft and then talking to Kat, who's the greatest writer on earth. So the three tenets of the book, love, listen and learn, each of these kind of encompass the research that we know of um, that is the foundation for these really beneficial connections between a, a child and their caregiver. We had many rounds um, with that and um, I think we were reaching a good result finally. I mean I just can't believe it when I see the book and I and I think you know two years ago I met this bunch of strangers I had no idea where this was going to go and now we've created something that is not only I think it's beautiful to look at I think the rhymes are great but hopefully it really is something unique and something that parents can, can use and have a positive impact. That to me is success. When parents and caregivers and teachers say, oh, they're informed, they're intentional about what they're doing, and they can take this research-based content and just be able to integrate it. It's all about empower the parent and you'll inspire the child. I think that's something to remember and I think that's one of the positive things about LSX. I think that that's, that's why we're all working together. So lovely. Um, it's really fun to see others' reactions to that as well. So, um, oh my gosh. So we're going to bring everyone, um, make sure you can come on camera here with us. Kat and Yana and Megan and Jill will be joining for a discussion about this. Um, it's just, congrats you guys. It's really exciting to see that. Um, so we will have our first question. So for everyone who's attending, Definitely give us your questions, put them in the Q&A, and I'll, I'll be watching along with my uh, staff here. But we do have a first question I know that's going to come in from Michael Levine, who is a senior VP at Nickelodeon and in charge of learning and impact at Noggin. And oh, great, there he is. So Michael, thanks so much for, for being with us today. Um, what did you think and what question would you like to ask of our fellows? Oh my gosh, good afternoon. Hi, can you guys see me? Um, that was just such a refreshing delight. And I think you've actually encapsulated the brilliance of this multidisciplinary collaboration right there. I cannot wait to read these books. I do think you may have some trademark issues, but we can talk about that later because uh, 
the Pat the Bunny, um, you know, uh, series is iconic and really, really um, something that I'm sure you guys looked at and might have inspired you. Um, what can I say? I mean, um, the notion that you guys would combine empowerment of parents with um, the science of, re you know, dialogic reading with something that is so creative and appealing is really, it's one of the best things I've seen in a long time. <laughs> I mean, just to be totally honest, it's so great. Um, I have two questions. One, and I, you know, obviously I wanna see the books. I mean, I'm ready to buy my first book. Um, how much kind of adjusting and iterating did the team, the team looks like it came together brilliantly. Um, I mean, did you like experience any tensions between the science and the beautiful creative process that you guys, you know, organized? Um, and, you know, what is it that you learned from the dynamic of collaborating that you think that you will bring back to your work? And I'll, I'll have one follow-up question after you answer that. Um, I think that from the moment we all met at our first meeting in, in Pittsburgh, or in Philadelphia, um, it was really, we, we just bonded and we bonded on so many levels. We came together on our passions for wanting to um, learn more about healthy attachments and the, and the research that Megan does and that Yana does. And um, I think that we as a group really came together for wanting to create a whole world, a bunny to bunny world that was included every element in the ecosystem of a child's life. And so we started with a board book and I think our process, um, I think that it was very thoughtful and intentional and collaborative in the sense that we were all learning from each other and we all had a gift to bring to the table that really I think filters through the book in so many aspects of the creative and of the research. Um, I'll turn it over to my colleagues to add to that. I'll just quickly add that um, I think as the researcher in the group what was what I really learned in this process was what was really obvious to me as a researcher was absolutely not obvious. And, and I, um, to others, and, and I think we live in, and I, I have to say, I feel really passionate about um, um, translating the work I do into ways that can be really feasible and practical for parents and caregivers. And so I thought, well, yeah, I have this, you know, I, I've done this before. And then Kat would come in and just, she was just brilliant. And she would say, jargon, jargon, jargon. I thought I was translating, but my version was really quite different. So we had to do a lot of checking. And then Jill would sometimes in the science notes, she would say, well, something and I'd say, well, we can't quite use that word because we don't actually can't ask the babies this. And so we just had a lot of back and forth about just being careful um, and, and just being true to the science. Yeah, I think I could add to that because Megan is a fantastic communicator and, um, and Jill obviously knows exactly what you have to do to kind of um, package things up in a way that's appealing to the audience. So, but um, one of the things that I found often was that Megan just assumed that people, you know, like it was obvious to people and she would just say something fascinating about her research and then follow up with, but everybody knows that. And I'm like, no, Megan, like people don't know that. And like, I'm a science journalist, so I probably know more about it than like a lot of people and I'm a parent, but I still don't know that. So, um, so I think, yeah, we all learned from that, um, kind of experience. And I think I learned so much from from Jill and Yana as well about like how to um, communicate to different kinds of audiences that I'm not used to communicating to as well. Yes, I totally agree. Um, I think um, we had a good time. It was a challenging time to, to bring in our perspectives, but we also learned to really listen to each other. And that was so rewarding and a big part of this fellowship to really learn from each other. So yeah, we enjoyed that. So Lisa, is it okay if I have one quick follow-up? Yes, yes, quick. And we've got a couple more, but then yeah. we'll have to, we'll have so, to move along um, very quickly. So there's a, a big body of research around, you know, parent tips 
and I'd be glad to share some of it with you guys and with the extra audience. I've done a lot of work on digital um, creation, I'm now leading the Noggin Learning Service. And um, I'm curious about how you guys decided, that they're usually unsuccessful, um, especially when they're separate from the experience that the you know, kid and the, and, and the parent are going through. How did you guys think about the parent empowerment piece around the tips and would you be open to an adjustment? And I think that some of the thinking behind it, and we, we definitely would be very grateful for um, your expertise and um, definitely open to adjustment. But the, I think our logic was that at one point we were talking about, should we put the tips? We wanted to, we wanted to, show to parents what was different about this book that it's not just like a random collection of things that were put on a page that there was intention behind it that is based in science it's based in really good science and um which is hard to describe to people especially when you're talking about things like love which is not a very scientific term in itself um, so at one point we talked about having the tips kind of um perhaps as like badges on the page as you go along so you can see at the, page by page what it's referring to and then we thought about how many times as a parent you read a book to your child and how over it you are by the like 20th 50th time you read it and so we just thought those tips are just going to get so annoying so perhaps it's better to have it at the back and the other thing is that we wanted this to be a product that people can use and that the um simply the act of, of reading this book to a child will bring about some of those interactions that we know are really beneficial to children. So we didn't want to interrupt that process and we didn't want to have these barriers as, as the parent went along. So we wanted the notes to be something that if the parent was interested to know more or caregiver, doesn't have to be a parent, um, they could go to the back and find out about it, but they could also just completely ignore it and they can just pick up the book and use it and it is a, a complete thing in itself and you don't need to get into the science if you don't want to. So that was our kind of, our thinking. Brilliant. Um, we're looking for books of this sort at Noggin. Let's talk. Ooh, that's <laughs> exciting. Thank Great. you so much, Michael. So we've My had a pleasure. couple other questions that have come in. I'm just gonna combine them um, and then each of you can just uh, answer quickly to the ones that must pertain. One question is, um, Oops, sorry, I just lost it here. Is the book available for purchase anywhere? And I know not yet, but if you guys wanna answer that, that would be terrific. And then there also are questions coming in about whether there's thought about translating into other languages. Um, there's a question about whether there were any tensions between the visual messages um, and the beautiful illustrations of the book and the science. So just um, looking popcorn out a couple of answers to that, and then we'll move to our, our third group. Um, so we are looking for partners with regards to the printing and distribution of the book um, and also with how we can create that wider reach. Um, we are absolutely looking into um, translations um, in multiple languages and um, Jana is really um, wonderful in, uh, in her assessment of how to go about that and what we need to do with that. Um, uh, Going back to the question from a creative perspective in the science and, and how to communicate that from a way that um, our audience or our readers, our families, caregivers will have an entry point into, into that comfort and what we're, that connection that we're looking to establish. Um, I think one of the things that we thought a lot about is, is a, co a continuity and a thread that we could thread throughout the book, which is why we came up with the three tenets of love, listen, and learn. And as Megan and Kat um, alluded to earlier, love is kind of hard in the research community. How do you, you can't really measure that. Um, but we also, we felt we struck a balance creatively and from a research sense of what could we give our audience that they could really um, latch on to. And so that's, that, I hope that answers that part of the question. I would just add quickly that um, I think there's just so much back and forth about how do you continue to um, press upon this connection with the research and not overstepping what we can say and being true to the science. And um, as the researcher in the group, that was you know, kind of my job to um, continue to push us uh, in, in to make sure that we could 
it was is extremely rigorous i will say like <laughs> this is like a great peer review group um for the work i mean we had to back up every single word uh and so i i felt really confident by the end and and i also just want to say that we care very much um about the evaluation of this sort of book and are applying for projects and grants so that we can really evaluate because i do a lot of research on evaluation um and um interventions. And so I think that's also an important piece. Well, I'm going to have to move us to the next group, but um, congratulations, you guys. It's exciting to see this and, um, and we'll have moments for us all to be together, um, continuing to talk about it in the chat and in the discussion later. So um, Fabulous, fabulous stuff. So our next and our third group that we're going to show everybody who's attending um, is a group that includes Meredith Rowe of the Harvard Graduate School of Education, Sasha Kyle, a theater and TV director in Scotland, Elizabeth Shuey of OECD coming to us from Paris, and Melissa Hagenboom of the BBC and editor of BBC Real. So they too have um, just developed something amazing. I can't wait for you to hear their story. So we'll roll with their story now. Language is such a fundamental part of early childhood and the development of language and hearing language. It's really a building block for uh, social and cognitive development. If you measure children's vocabulary when they get to kindergarten, so how many words they know, it's super predictive of like their reading skills later on in fourth grade, for example. And we have these huge achievement gaps by socioeconomic status in reading. That's a problem because it means that as a society, we're not giving all children an equal footing to start with um, as they're coming into public schooling. I was really excited to see the LSX announcement when it came out. The brief was, we want to cross collaborate with people and combine art forms um, with science. I was like, that ah, brilliant, brilliant. This is what I want to do. This is what I'm interested in. And how exciting would it be to work with and people from different worlds and different fields to make the work that I'm doing even even more interesting and have more of a, a background to it and be more accessible. I was really drawn to areas of research surrounding poverty and how it impacts children. That tied directly to this big project I've been working on in the criminal justice system. And one of the scientists in the group, Meredith, her work was all about the word gap. So the word gap is the fact that children from higher socioeconomic backgrounds are exposed to many more words during early childhood than children from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, basically at home. But the important piece of it that we know now is that it's not so much the gap in quantity that matters, but it's the gap in quality. So having those sort of really high quality conversations with the children is what we're finding is more important. To the point that early childhood can really make a difference for a person throughout their whole life. Um, one of the things that we try to emphasize uh, around policies is also that, yes, that's the case, but it needs to be something that's a sustained investment and not equivalent to an inoculation. That, you know, we need to have strong transitions into primary school as well then and uh, continued opportunities for all children. This may sound cheesy, but it really was a true collaborative idea. I don't know at which point it came up, but as soon as it did, we all kind of jumped on it. We're like, someone might have said, let's make a PSA. Let's, oh, we could do that in animation. Oh, I could write the script. Or uh, I, like, we all kind of jumped to it and saw that this is an idea we can action well with our contacts. And we really believed in it. And I think that was the key thing. We believed in the message. We knew we could communicate it across and we knew we could make something beautiful. So very early on in the brainstorming of the animation, we thought, what better way to get this across by having a child read it. But we wanted it to feel very much child-centered, so that the voice was coming from the child of, you know, talk with me, that's all you need to do, let's have a chat together, let's hang out. And um, Rather than being told, I think there's a lot of, sometimes parents feel that they're being lectured to, or they're being told to do this. In order to get a healthy child, you should be doing this. And we really wanted to avoid that. We wanted to say, look, it's quite, you know, it should be enjoyable. It's, an, it's a natural thing. When we envisaged how it would look, we did have some initial ideas. We wanted something quite simplistic. Um, but the benefit of working in this field already is I have a few animators that I've worked with before who I trust. I don't only really trust them to produce really visually stunning 
pieces, I trust them to take the concept of the science I'm working with and translate it into the best ideas possible. And then we all loved the visuals that came back and we ran with it. And then my daughter Saya was the, the voice in the piece, which was actually really lovely. Um, it was done as a bit of a, a, let's just see how this sounds. And everyone seemed to like her uh, voice, which was really nice for her. And it's been brilliant for her to see it all come together as well. One thing I've learned just through doing small research studies, parents who do know more about child development and about you know what kids are capable and about interacting with children, do then ultimately sort of interact with them in ways that promote learning. So there is something very much to be said for just getting information out there in an accessible way so that if parents want to access it, they can. I'm really grateful for the fellowship and the opportunity to engage with this incredible group of people. It's just been a really great experience for me personally to work with such a diverse group of people and learn a lot about different industries. I mean, I still have a lot to learn, but it's been a, it's been a great experience for sure. It's really, really fun to see you all. We're going to go ahead and go straight to playing the beautiful animation that you've created. And then we'll bring you all on screen for a quick conversation. Do you know how much my brain is growing every day? As soon as I am born, before I can even talk, I hear what you're saying and it's helping my brain. It's actually lighting up in so many different places, all at once. What's really amazing is that there's a way to make my brain go even more, and we can all do it. It's very simple, and lots of fun. It's a bit like sharing. It's all about taking turns and talking about lots of little things or even big things, like what does it rain, or how do flowers go. You can also talk to me when we play together and ask me things, like do you like dinosaurs, or can you see the moon tonight? I also love it when you sing and read to me. It makes my brain light up everywhere. Try it. How was your day today? Talk with me. So, so lovely. Okay. Um, thank you guys so much. And also thanks to our, our participants for bearing with us through our doing this all through Zoom, <laughs> but we, we are really glad we were able to show these um, videos and didn't have too much audio lag, at least on their products. So thank you all. Oh my gosh. So, all right. It's wonderful. I see Melissa, you're on screen and Meredith is with us as well. And um, do we, do we have Elizabeth? And I just want to make sure everyone's joined. Okay. Elizabeth and Sasha, you're there too. Good. Thank you guys so much. Um, we are going to have our first question come from uh, one of our participants, uh, Sita Pai, who is joining us. I see Sita's with us on camera. Hello, Sita. She is the Executive Director for Education at WGBH in Boston. And Sita, thank you so much. We're really interested in your, your take on this. We'll be taking other questions too in a moment, but um, what, what would you like to ask the fellows? Thanks, Lisa, and thank you all for, um, calling on me to ask you to respond and ask a question. And hi, Meredith, uh, who I worked with before. And hello to um, your teammates. Um, quite lovely. I think this could be the, um, the chorus for today, but quite lovely. And what I especially loved was how you turned, um, you know, the typical narrative on its head by having the child speak. Um, that was really unusual, and I felt like it was quite successful um, in having, you know, the child kind of ask for what 
um, is needed and what science, um, what the research says is needed. So that was really stuck out in beautiful visual style and all of that also, of course, but what really stuck with me was that it was a child speaking, which uh, almost kind of backgrounded the science um, and, and made it much more approachable. So that was quite lovely in that respect. Um, which led me to a couple of questions, um, which may, I mean, actually apply to all three groups really, but um, specifically for you all, um, what, who do you think your audience is? We've heard a lot about parents spoken of as this general, what I'm almost hearing as a bit of a monolith, and we know that that's not the case. Um, who do you think your audience is? And to plug what Ralph said earlier, um, you know, if you're sort of talking to a particular group of parents, did you think to include them in, in the creative process? Um, or is that something you could think about in the next step? And how might it have been different if one of your kind of a intended beneficiaries, ultimate beneficiaries was, in, was included? And I'm asking specifically as a relative minority in the field of, of uh, early childhood and in fact early childhood media as well. I mean if we look across all of us, uh, we're all fairly privileged, um, pretty homogenous, and so we don't often give, we don't often bring our ultimate beneficiaries to the table. We're trying to do that more at GBH, but I wondered how you thought about your audience and how they might be included. Um, I think one of our kind of priorities for doing the PSA was to make sure that we get as much audience reach as possible and have the biggest impact. And I think in terms of the child's voice, um, we really wanted it to be child-centered so that parents who are often bombarded with so many messages all the time, and again, how to, you know, be told how to raise their children, um, are, are being told in a different way, which is, look, this is natural. We just need to be together. We just need to chat together, read together, have conversations, and you're helping my brain grow. And you're you know, setting me up for a lifelong positive way of learning. And I'll let Meredith chat a little bit more about our audience as well, I think. Thanks, Sasha. Yeah, hi, Sita. Thanks for the great questions. Um, you know, we actually did think, we had a whole conversation back in Zurich and thought about starting with uh, some focus groups to sort of address the question you're asking directly and we, with the way this fellowship worked we really didn't have time to fit that into the process um so we relied a bit on kathy hirsch basics research actually she had done a bunch of focus groups in uh, i think in philadelphia and she was the one actually that i think uncovered this idea about the child's voice uh baby being a little bit more um, compelling and I think she has an intervention that which maybe she can comment um, anyway that also uses that perspective it's like the sibling talking or something like that um, so we really just tried to rely on what we knew from other people's work to jump into something I one reason I really like the animation though is because since it is animated I feel like we could change the voice right so this is Sasha's daughter right so she's got the Scottish accent but it could be any voice and and that could make it more appealing to different people I think um, depending on what the child sounds like you know we could do it in Portuguese and show it in Brazil or you know just widen our audience that way which without having to change the animation which would be quite nice um, I don't know if anyone else, Elizabeth or Melissa, want to add anything? Yeah, uh, I'd love just... to. Go there ahead, go. Melissa. Okay, to, to that point, it's, it's always difficult in this field where the people that you reach most are the ones who already know the message. Um, and that's why I think this fellowship is so great because we have people like um, this, the scientists, Kathy and Roberta's team, who've done this before in very underrepresented areas who know how to get the message across to groups that we wouldn't otherwise reach. And so I think moving this forward, we'd rely on people like them to really bring this message uh, to groups that we might not otherwise think to reach. And I just want to add to that, that um, one of the things that was really important to me was that um, the line in the video about we can all do this, that, you know, it's not just only parents. Um, my work focuses a lot on child care providers. Uh, we talked in some of the about um, family, friend and neighbor. 
child care providers in earlier parts of this discussion. And I think it's really important that that, that group is included as part of the audience also, um, as well as extended family caregivers. So beyond kind of a traditional parent perspective, uh, we tried to make the message something that could be used beyond just um, a traditional kind of view of what uh, is seen in the media of family or of a child care provider. And also there is that one slide in there that I love with the father with the child on his shoulders. And it just, I just think it was important having a father in there. I mean, you know, the animation is um, not so specific anyway, but that, that was a nice touch, I think, too. Yeah, well, thank you. I, d I did appreciate that the animation was, you know, seemed malleable and, and, and ch changeable in that way, because it wasn't identifying a very specific um, location or a specific context. So in that sense, you've potentially made something that could be changed in different places. So yeah, I appreciate that. Um, I appreciate, certainly appreciated that. So Lisa, I will leave yeah. it for others to ask questions and not hog. I have about 25 others, but <laughs> I'll leave it for others. Thank you for including me. Thank you so much, Sita. Um, yeah, well, we have had a couple other questions come in. We, we're, we're a little bit late on time. So again, I'll just mention a couple of them. And then if you guys want to answer and then any closing remarks, and then we'll get to the last part of our um, more open discussion. Um, one is um, related to this uh, issue that you've already been addressing, which is just um, how to ensure that resources like this um, can be shared with different with families in different socioeconomic uh, circumstances, and I I know because you guys had talked about it early on that this was um, one idea was that this could be in the in the United Kingdom could be part of a larger kind of campaign that um, is perhaps reaching different um, socioeconomic. Uh, levels that way. Um, there's also lots of questions about just seeing the video and wanting access um, to, to it and to be able to kind of watch it again because everyone's loved it so much. Um, and then, so why don't you guys, if, you, if there's anything more you want to say about the ensuring that this can get out to um, different families in different circumstances, that would be great. And then we'll open up to many more folks for our panel, or, I mean, our larger open discussion. Um, I just want to add as part of our group, what we've been discussing is alongside the animation and um, to extend the message of this conversational turn taking is to put it into a book that can be given to parents um, when they give birth to their children. Um, and in Scotland, they currently do this with baby boxes and they have books within that where they hand out books of um, uh, for, for the early years at that age level. So we're thinking of maybe doing that as an extension of our message. So alongside the PSA, you would also be able to access the book which could be delivered to, to families at all, all stages as well. I'll let Meredith or whoever answer that as well. Yeah, I would just say that the beauty of an animation is it can be widely shared by any partner who gets involved. Anyone who has a large social media following, it can pop up in people's social media feeds. Um, the book we've already had designed by the same animator in a book friendly format. So we've, we've got loads of assets ready to go so we can kind of get this message out there um, in lots of different ways, I think, with, with the hope it will reach as many people as possible. Yeah, I, I'll just add that we, we would like to get it out there as widely as possible. So if anyone is interested in partnering with us to do that, please let us know. Um, we just finished, it's sort of hot off the press, so we... Yes. <laughs> And doing all of this virtually and remotely uh, is a really amazing too. So thank you guys so much. Um, I, I should have noted from the outset, and I want to make sure I do now, that those stories that, are for, that we, these three stories of these three groups of fellows were produced by this wonderful uh, film team um, or documentary team called Maeve Partners. And they did all of this just in the past two months by doing additional interviews with all of our fellows, sending cameras and mics to their homes across oceans um, to pull it together. And um, we're, we're thrilled to have those stories and be able to kind of tell the behind the scenes. So now we're bringing everyone who's been kind of um, part of the early panel, as well as our fellows into just a broader discussion. We've just got a few minutes for this, but we have had some really good questions coming in. Um, and I'm going to try to um, to make sure that as we're, as we're talking, we're getting to some of the key ones. Several questions just broadly about this 
this program in general, about the fellowship, about the relationships that have been built, have been looking at this question of um, diversity and representation and also the in in inclusion. Um, and so one of the points made, and I'll just um, read this question off, but feel free to, to use it to go in what direction you might want to for all of our panelists, um, is that Black, Indigenous, and people of color have been repeating the need for changes in research, education, and media for years and years. Um, and yet kind of the, this repetition of the message may not be really the issue. It may be that it's how white people are finally hearing the message that seems to matter. How can we be more intentional about hearing feedback from people, even when the message from them is that it's our bias um, that uh, might be in the way? of making impact. So there's a lot, lot in that question, but I think there's some really interesting points in there to try to untangle. Um, and I'm wondering who, who may want to kind of tackle that first, um, just thinking about these broad questions of audience and inclusion. Lisa, can I jump in for just a sec? It's Kathy. Yes, yeah. Um, I just want to say that in a, in a lot of projects that I'm doing now, I'm doing research that's community-based participatory research with Roberta. And we're doing exactly what I, I think Ralph and Joan were asking of us as researchers, which is to make sure that you have the people who are meant to be the audience included um, in focus groups early on. And what we've come to realize is that while it takes a lot longer to do this kind of research, it's been considerably more powerful. Um, let me just take one example and, and show you what I mean by that. We had tried to do some um, research in what we call the duet project. And um, when we first drew the animated characters from which the sibling idea was born, because um, we realized that parents didn't want to be talked at. They wanted to be talked with. And it was considerably less threatening to have a sib. But the second problem we ran into was the voice of the child. Um, we were working with a principally um, Black community as an audience. And we quickly learned that we better make sure that the voices are not little white children because that was seen as an insult and we're now converting it to um, Latino to Spanish and we're going through the focus group process yet again. So I think it's involving more people in the research. Are there any other thoughts on this broader question? Well, you know, Lisa, I have a thought about the overall content of what we're trying to convey. And one of the things that I would urge the next class to do, and anyone that's doing this work, is to send messages to parents that we need to celebrate the diversity of the country and to convey that to our children as a value. Um, and that, to me, is, is as important as any other content issue that we could be conveying right now particularly you know i would i would weigh in um to agree with joan but also to point out that much of research takes a monolithic approach for instance we see these families as failing in many respects but even in the weakest community, there are families that succeed and kids that are doing well. So there's a legitimate question of what's working for those families? What are they doing? And that is rarely ever the question. Mm -hmm. The question is, what can we bring? rather than are there some indigenous solutions that have been cultivated sometimes over generations in these same neighborhoods which protect resilience 
uh, and encourage success. And to the extent that we never see research as asking that question, there's very good reason why there's a bias against research. You know, if we, and, and I think there are occasions where where we have looked, there are a few occasions where we have looked uh, for that. And Robin Jarrett, uh, researcher in Illinois, um, essentially says, what do we know about the top 10% of the graduating class in the worst high schools? There's something there. And she looked at it and this was uh, 25 years ago. And she found that one of the characteristics they had were their parents arranged for their children to have some place to go after school and reduce the amount of exposure to uh, community influences and increased, increased the experiences that kids have. That research is never mentioned when we talk of after school programs. So my uh, advice here would be to invert the question a bit. And rather than assuming that nothing is working and therefore we have to bring something, let's figure out how we look for what's already working and try to see whether we can um, replicate, synthesize and scale it. Thank you so much, Ralph, actually. I'm, uh, my mind is taking in a lot to apply to our own work in the next two years. Um, but also there's so many good things that what you've said have triggered, they're being put in the chat right now. So I really encourage people to go there and see some of the new ideas that are coming up um, from that. I'm afraid I'm gonna have to actually cut off this discussion because we're nearing the end. Um, and I really hope we can continue it in many other ways um, online. What we want to do next is um, our final announcement, um, our announcement of our, our next class of fellows. We're going to bring Kathy and Roberta back in, um, as well as put a slide up for everyone to see so that we can, um, can bring you to this new point, and then we'll say a quick closing. So Kathy and Roberta, take it away. All right, thanks, Lise. And I just want to say that I'm so excited about this process. We are about to announce the new class of fellows. So take it, Roberta. Our first fellow comes to us from the world of research. And her name is Judith Ganovich. Our second fellow comes to us also from the world of research. These are how we're dividing them up into the sectors. Elizabeth Gunderson. And our third fellow is Maida Carey. And together they will be put into the separate groups to create their own projects. In the world of journalism, we have Lillian Anekwi, we have Jack Graham, and Annie Murphy Paul. From the world of policy, we have Brenda Bushouse, Kathy Mitchell, and Emmy O'Dwyer. From the world of social entrepreneurship, we have Pooja Balachander, Tammy Kwan, and Jakob Slowinski. And last but not least for sure, from the world of entertainment, we have Jeff Kleeman, John Sessler, and Ariel Zeckelman. And I am so personally excited to get to know each and every one of you. You are all outstanding people. Congratulations. Yeah, it is, it's really exciting. I just feel incredibly lucky <laughs> to be able to work with all of the fellows from the first cohort and the new ones that are joining us. Many of, we've already been meeting many times this summer and they'll be working with the old fellows when they can, but also learning from advisors and from all of you who've been participating in this. Um, we really encourage you to reach out. We want to be doing as much kind of cross pollinating as we as we possibly can. Um, I want to also just note, and this is a, a bit just from the world of journalism, which many of you know, but that's kind of where I started was as a reporter. These ideas about both um, connecting 
research to real life, communicating succinctly, communicating in a way that helps people um, feel connected. Um, we really hope, and, and we're already seeing the fruits of this in our work through the, the journalism fellows who have been part of our work, but also through some of the um, blog posts that our, our fellows are doing. So in addition to all of these amazing projects that you've seen and the these prototypes and PSAs. We also have each of the fellows are doing some writing. A lot of that's already on our on our website. More will be coming out over the, the coming years, whether it's writing in an outside outlet or for the publications that the Jacobs Foundation and New America publishes. And we're hoping that, that too will be able to um, bridge many of these gaps we've been talking about today. So we're now um, very, very close to being out of time. And I just need to say a few thank yous um, to everyone. First, of course, um, as I see on, on screen right now here, I wanna make sure everyone knows how to stay in touch with us. Um, we're all pretty accessible. The All of the people that you heard speaking today, all of their Twitter handles are in the agenda that's online. Um, and so please follow them on Twitter. And we now have a Twitter handle for the LSX program um, specifically called LSX Fellowship. We just opened it in the past 24 hours or so, um, but you can also find much more um, as you see on screen here through these other channels as well. I wanna say just a huge thank you to the team that's made all of this possible. Um, we had um, hundreds of people interested in this and registered for this, and that's because of the hard work of so many um, people behind the scenes. So a big thank you to Elise Brancino, to Riker Pestakevich, to Angela Spitalette, to Narmada Varium, to Jason Stewart, Samantha Webster, Hannah Hancock, Fabio Mergia, Sabia Prescott, Claire King and the May Partners Group. Um, to, of course, to all of our fellows who've been dealing with all of our emails, and <laughs> many, many meetings, and, um, and to the Jacobs Foundation, a huge, huge thank you. So I hope I didn't forget anybody in that. And I'm really just thrilled to be with you all. Um, all of this will be recorded and available and we will continue the conversation online. Thank you, everybody. Have a really great day.